This lesson is for section 9.4 on writing equations of hyperbolas. We have two objectives for today. We're going to complete the square so that we can determine um, what type of quadratic shape we have. So after we decide which conic section we have, we'll go ahead and graph it. And then our second objective is to write the equation of a hyperbola when we are given specific information. All right, in our first example, we're asked to determine the shape of the quadratic that's given in this particular equation below. Then we're asked to graph the figure. Now to figure out the type of conic section that we're dealing with in this particular equation, we'll want to complete the square so that we can write this equation in standard form. So right off the bat, I make sure that if there's any constant term in the equation that I separate that from the variables. Um, but in this case, it's already been separated. So here, 36 is on the other side. So I can go ahead and start trying to factor out the lead coefficient of the quadratic terms. So here's one of the quadratic terms, and here's the other quadratic term. So our lead coefficient here is 1 for that x squared term. So we don't actually have to factor it out, but I'm going to just so I stay consistent with all of the steps here in the other equations that we work on. Um, make sure you don't factor out an x. Okay, You're only looking to factor out the lead coefficient. So I'm going to leave myself a little bit of a space here and then factor out a negative 4 from the second quadratic part, which um, would leave me with y squared and then minus 2y because that sign is going to change. So be careful about sign changes and then another space, and then equals 36. All right, now we work on completing the square, so we're going to cut the linear term in half and square the value. So we cut 4 in half, we get 2, square it, we get 4. This is going to be a positive always, so on the other side, I'm going to add 4 to balance the equation. Okay. Now, um, in the other linear term here, I cut that in half and I get negative 1, square that, and I get positive 1. Now, when I balance the term over here on the other side, a lot of you guys um, on the quiz only added something like 1 to the other side. Make sure that you multiply this value here by the factor out in front. So we're actually taking away 4 on the other side. Okay. Now, um, if we rewrite this, I now have x plus 2 squared minus 4 times y minus 1 squared equaling 36. All right, now at this point, you should be asking yourself what type of conic section you're seeing based off of the equation. So let's try to eliminate some. Well, so far, we know this cannot be a circle. It can't be a circle because we have that negative sign in between the two perfect squares here. So that's definitely not a circle. But also, we only have a constant out in front of one of the terms. If this was something like negative 4 um, times x plus 2 squared minus 4 times y minus 1 squared equaling a number over here that was also negative, then we would have to recognize that this is actually a circle if you divide out by negative 4 on all of the parts because then you're left with x plus 2 squared plus y minus 1 squared equaling positive 9 so it would fall into the equation of a circle okay but because we have um, a constant term in front of one of the perfect squares and not in front of both it can't be a circle okay now um, we can also eliminate the, the ellipse because of that negative sign. So obviously, um, you know, it's in the hyperbola section. This is going to be a hyperbola, but a lot of times students have a hard time deciding what conic they have. So make sure you're always analytical about how you decide what type of conic you're graphing. Okay, so with that said, we recognize that this must be a hyperbola because we have a negative sign in front of one of the perfect squares and not in front of both. So we're going to try to put this now in standard form. Remember, for standard form, you have to have one on one side. And a lot of you did not do that on the quiz as well today. So make sure you do this. We get 1 on the right-hand side. Over on the left-hand side, this first term does not need to be simplified at all. But our second term here is going to become y minus 1, that quantity squared, all over 9. So we have the negative sign out in front still. So this hyperbola here would have to open left to right because that negative is in front of the y squared term. Okay. Now the r sub x and the r sub y are easy to spot. We just take the square root of these two values here. And then we're ready to start graphing. Okay, so at this point, this is now a review of yesterday's lesson. So what I'd like you to do is go ahead and graph uh, this hyperbola and include all the important information that is necessary for the hyperbola. So make sure you do practice this because eventually you're going to be required on a test or a quiz to, to list all the important information without being prompted on what those parts are. So right now is the time to practice those skills. Okay, I'd like you to try the next example as well. So you're going to have to complete the square here and then determine what type of conic you have. So go ahead and graph it as well and then check with the key. All right, in the last portion of the lesson, we're going to go through several examples where we write the equation of a hyperbola that fits the given information in each example. So off to the side, I'm just going to write in the general form for a hyperbola. Now the only thing is I can't actually put signs in front of each of the terms 
because uh, we don't know which way the hyperbola is supposed to open. So right now, we just are missing some signs here. Now, in this particular problem, they give you vertices. Okay, so that's going to tell you the direction that your hyperbola opens. So these vertices here lie on top of one another. You have one at 1, 1, and one at 1, negative 3. So you're just drawing a rough sketch here. It doesn't have to be perfect. But basically, you can see here then that the hyperbola would have to open up and down if vertices are um, stacked on top of one another. So now we can actually fill in the signs over here. We know that there should be a negative in front of the x term and a positive in front of that y squared term. All right, so now let's try to work on finding the um, center. We can find the center by finding the midpoint between our vertices. So let's average that. We know that the midpoint has to be um, the same x coordinate there, so we know for sure it's going to be 1. And then if we average the um, y values here, we get negative 2 and divide it by 2, so that gives me negative 1. So now the general equation here changes to a more particular one. We have the opposite of x minus 1 squared all over some value r sub x squared, then plus y minus a negative 1 turns into y plus 1 squared all over some r sub y squared equaling 1. Okay, so now let's work on finding the r sub x squared value and the r sub y squared value. So we actually have to go back to our vertices to gather some more information. So the distance between those vertices represents the transverse axis length, right? Now, the transverse axis is directly related to r sub y in this case because our transverse axis runs up and down. So that means we can find r sub y. To find that, we need to know what the total length of that um, transverse axis is. In this case, it's four units. So r sub y, remember, is just half of that because it represents the distance from the center to a vertex. So that means um, here that the r sub y value is 2. So when we come over here to write that in, we want to square r sub y, so we get 4 underneath the y squared term. All right, so all we have left to find now is the r sub x squared value. Now to find that, we actually have to look back at this piece of information that was given in the beginning of the problem where they list the foci. So remember, whenever you're given foci, even when it was an ellipse, we had to use an equation that related the foci, or the focal distance, I should say, with the r sub x and r sub y values. When you did the ellipse, we used f squared was equal to r sub x squared minus r sub y squared, or r sub y squared minus r sub x squared, depending on which one was the larger value. Well, here, we don't have to worry about which one's larger because um, we're just using a sum. So this is r sub x squared plus r sub y squared. So that's relating back to how we found the focal distance when we graphed the hyperbolas. So please make sure, I think this is so important, that you should bring attention to this in your notes so that when you go back to study this, that you recognize that you have to find the sum of the r sub x squared and the r sub y squared in order to solve for f. Now, if we try to solve this equation as is, we're missing too many parts. We want to solve for r sub x squared, but we only know r sub y squared is 4. We're still missing the focal distance. We don't know what the value of f is. So we have to come back to our foci to try to find f. So if f is your focal radius, that means you want to find the distance between the center, which is at 1, negative 1, and one of the foci. And I'm just going to list one of them. So 1 and then negative 1 plus root 5. Okay, so we want to find the overall distance between those two values, or those two coordinates. Now, as you can see here, um, the center would just be translated up root 5 units, making that the overall distance between those two points. So um, if root 5 is f, that means here, when I square f, I end up with 5 equaling r sub x squared plus 4. So I solve for r sub x squared, and I end up with 1. So I come back here, and I just write 1 in there, because that's where r sub x squared is supposed to go. So here I have the equation of that hyperbola that matches the given information. All right, since number 6 is actually very similar to number 5, they list the vertices and the foci for this hyperbola, I would like you guys to try this one on your own and check with the key. There is a problem, though, with this um, coordinate here. That should be a negative 3, so I'm not sure if it's already changed on your note sheet for you, but go ahead and change that if it's not a negative 3. Now, when you um, try to determine the shape of this hyperbola, the vertices here are to the left and right of one another. So we have one at negative 3, negative 3, and another at 5, negative 3. So now this hyperbola opens left and right. Okay, so the first thing you should always do when you're given a problem where you're asked to write the equation of a hyperbola is draw out a general sketch of that hyperbola. 
Okay, in our last problem, we are given the vertices of a hyperbola as well as the length of its conjugate axis, okay? So based off of the vertices, I can go ahead and draw a rough sketch of how this hyperbola should look. So if I have vertices at negative seven, zero and seven, zero, that means the hyperbola should open left and right. So because I know the hyperbola opens left to right, I can go ahead and start writing the particular equation for the hyperbola. I know that the x squared term is gonna remain positive out in front, that should be the sign out in front, but the y squared term should be negative. So I'm gonna leave myself some blanks here, and this would be the general form. So now I have to just fill in these missing spots. So I think finding the center is pretty easy for you guys, so let's do that one first. Um, if we find the center, um, we're looking for the midpoint between the vertices, so the midpoint here is clearly gonna be zero, zero. So we have x minus zero and y minus zero here inside the parentheses. And then we can also tell the r sub x value here from the vertices that are given because if we look at the distance between our center and um, one of the vertices, that distance here is seven. So r sub x is seven, which means we are just gonna square that to get the term underneath the x squared term. Okay, now um, for the final part here, let's go to the other piece of information. They tell you that the conjugate axis length is 10 units, and that's kind of nice here. They, they give you this segment here, all right? Now that represents, um, that it's directly related to r sub y, but it's not equal to r sub y. A lot of you guys had trouble with that when we gave you the minor and major axis for the ellipse. Don't just take this value here. You actually have to cut that in half. So the conjugate axis represents two times r sub y. It's the length of r sub y, r sub y times itself. So here, r sub y is only five units long. So we square that value and we put that inside here. So we have the general, I'm sorry, the particular equation for this hyperbola is x squared over 49 minus y squared over 25 equals one. Okay, so as you can see here, we never used the equation f squared is equal to r sub x squared plus r sub y squared, and that's because they did not give you um, the foci. So don't make more work for yourself than, than is necessary. So whenever they do give you foci, that's when you'll resort to using this equation. If they don't list foci, then you should be able to find all the parts without it. Um, but that is the end of the lesson, Deuterinos. So um, nice job. See you guys in class tomorrow. Please make sure you are trying the you try parts just to make sure you have these skills down. So I will see you manana.